Welcome everyone to Video Chess Training on YouTube with International Master William Pascal. Thanks for joining the channel. Don't forget to leave a like and subscribe. Today we're going to have a post-mortem analysis of a game I played and the important theoretical opening ramifications that it involved. This is a hyper-accelerated dragon. Sicilian defense analysis. I was playing white, although I do consider myself to be quite knowledgeable with black in this line. I've played more games with black than I have with white. This is a 15 minute game that I played online. And I believe I was live streaming when this game was played. The game doesn't begin with e4, but we quickly transpose to a Sicilian after e4, c5. Now white plays d4, I play d4, black plays c takes d. And knight takes d4 leads to a normal hyper accelerator accelerated dragon. Black can deal with white's choice of knight c3 or c4. But after queen takes d4, play takes on a much more forcing nature. This has always been one of my favorite variations to play with black in the hyper accelerated dragon. Here my opponent played knight f6. And now white has three main moves in this position e5. Bishop b5, a creative idea of David Bronstein, and the move I played knight to c3, which aims to solidly develop. The e5 move has some questions in the long term, I think because the e5 pawn can become a little overextended, the white has chances for a dangerous initiative there. The bishop b5 move is provocative, but I think also gives black sufficient counter chances. But in the game, the move I played knight c3, I think, in my experience as black, time has proven that this is the move that is strongest, most durable, and most problematic for black, and principally the most correct move. After knight to c3, black plays knight to c6. We play queen a4, which is critical. And now black has experimented with some offbeat moves in this position, including queen c7 and bishop g7. If queen c7 White has knight d5, and after knight takes d5, there have been a few games with knight takes d5, e takes d5, knight e5. But here, although we've seen some games in the database with bishop f4, I think knight d4 poses more problems when the knight on e5 isn't allowed to trade itself off and white retains a lasting advantage. The other possibility here is for black to play bishop g7 right away. A very rare move losing time because the knight has to go back to g8. After e5, knight g8, there was one game where Grandmaster Ruslan Panamaria played black, but I'm not sure if he meant to do it, it was an accident or what. He ended up winning against a strong opponent in the variation knight g8, bishop f4, f6, pawn takes f6, knight takes f6. But this line, I believe, clearly leaves something to be desired for black. White lost not because the opening wasn't good for him. White lost because Ponomario is a very, very strong player. So this is not a recommended line for Black. Instead, Black must do what he did in the game here, which is d6. After the move d6 instead of bishop g7, White's critical reply is e5. And this is where we start our analysis in the main variation. There are two alternatives here for Black deserve serious consideration. I think of d takes e somehow the more principal solid move and knight g4 being the more adventurous aggressive move. Knight g4 was actually played in the game but I wanted to take some time to show you all the critical lines in the other variation. d takes e5. I've, I've played both of these lines for black many times. So d takes e5, um, knight takes e5, and black has one variation I have used, it's only really good for black to try to draw, is the queen exchange, queen d4. This is kind of a wimpy line for black to try to draw against a stronger opponent. For example, the fourth variation, knight takes c6, queen takes a4, knight takes a4, b takes c. This position gives black some counter chances on the long diagonal, uh, maybe a strong knight on d5, but the weakness of the pawn structure and the outpost square c5 seems to indicate that white will have a lasting slight edge 
So many of the games in the database that I've seen were drawn. Black will almost never win in this line. So if you want to win with black, this is not an option. Instead of this, we have another move, bishop g7, another pawn sacrifice. This has been tried, for example, by American Grandmaster Eugene Perlstein. Um, not clear that black really has enough compensation in this particular line. So there was one game, Arismendi versus Perlstein, when something like knight takes c6, b takes c6, queen takes check, bishop d7, queen a6, castles, and I think white um, white developed with something like rook, bishop e2, um, and black played rook d8 at some point early on. But I, I don't think that this particular line is, um, is really sound. I don't think that white has serious problems against this, this pawn sacrifice. I think this pawn sacrifice is somewhat dubious for black, so I wouldn't trust it. There's better ways to play. Uh, for example, Grandmaster Perlstein himself, I think, you know, stopped playing that play bishop d7 uh, later on. Eugene is one of the one of the better players who regularly played the Accelerated Dragon in the last 15 years or so. So, kind of using him as an example. Uh, but after bishop d7, knight takes d7. Um, this is kind of the main line for black now. Bashir Legrave, amongst other players, have played this line for black. 75% to 80% of the players who play this line for black, I mean, some of them kind of experts, some of them novices in this particular line, uh, 75 to 80% of them are taking with the queen, which is okay for black, and he might have good chances to maintain a close to equal position. White gets a small advantage. But the other move is, is more interesting, I think, knight takes d7, when, although it seems like you're backpedaling, you're actually opening up the bishop on the long diagonal. You're clearing the way for the bishop. You're also guarding the diagonal a4, e8, where your king is. And in the event of bishop b5, now black can sacrifice a pawn with bishop g7, bishop takes c6, pawn takes c6. And if queen takes c6, and I think this would be my choice if I have to play this position again, um, rook c8, queen f3. I looked at this line, bishop takes f3, check, pawn takes f3, and queen a5, when it seems like, it really seems like here, black has adequate compensation for the pawn. White has a strong dark squared bishop, but the doubled pawns and the chances for the knight to have a good blockade, and the use of black of, of the blockading lines on, on the c, the blockading line on the c file, um, the potential to play with queen and knight, which is a very good combination, seem to indicate to me that this line is probably one of black's best chances to equalize against the knight c3 variation of this hyper-accelerated dragon. So that's the introduction, and these are the sidelines that could transpire if you choose to avoid our main line in the game. So getting back to the actual game, what transpires here is knight g4. And knight g4 is also a move I've played. I played this myself going back to a game in 1997 or 1998 against Grandmaster Peter Wells. But Wells against me played pawn takes d6. And this is, I guess, the main line. The problem with this variation is that it leads to an insanely complicated line. Black can simply take with the queen, which is what I did, I believe, against Grandmaster Wells. But black has the move queen b6 here, which leads to just mind-boggling complications. White has to worry about f2. There was one game where white, a weaker player, played knight d1 here to maintain equality, but this is not recommended. This is not what we're trying to, to do in this position. What we're trying to do is play aggressively, take the initiative. So if you enter into this variation with e takes d6, white needs to play very aggressively. I think the best ways to do that are knight d5, uh, aiming at c7, allowing queen takes f2 check. And the position is very complicated after queen takes f2 check, king d1. I recalled this, but not the exact lines, and I didn't want to go into this in a 15-minute game, for sure, if I couldn't remember the exact variation. But white does have an initiative here. The black king more than likely will end up going to d8, a mirror image of white's king. 
and the position is is quite complicated. The other possibility for white, I'm not sure it's quite as good, but interesting is is h3 on the next move. So um, h3, and then again, knight takes f2, not good. Queen takes f2, king d1, and again, very complicated position after something like knight f6, knight b5, threatening knight c7 check. Again, the king will be heading for d8. Mind-boggling is definitely the right word I use, because unless you have a computer program handy, uh, finding the right moves here over the board, I wouldn't want to attempt it in anything less than a standard game with more than an hour on the clock. So one cool variation I found using computer engine was bishop takes h3. Just to give you, I don't like to overuse computer analysis. You know, that's not what I'm here for. A lot of people do that, but that's not how we really improve. Sometimes as a tool, but uh, not to overuse it. But this was one variation I wanted to show. Bishop takes h3, when any capture leaves something hanging. So knight, and allowing knight c7 check, king d8, this is total chaos. Knight takes a8, bishop takes g2. The jury is out on this position, though. I think in all these lines, if white plays correctly, he would maintain an initiative. But it would re require a lot of research, a lot of memorization of a very, very sharp variation. So black has to be up for the challenge, and white has to be prepared for queen b6 in order for this to transpire. But I was not really in the mood for that, and I also stumbled upon a move which is a pretty good pedigree. The alternative here, which I think really should be the main line, bishop b5. It made sense to me to, to just develop quickly. And after bishop b5, we played a variation which is a quite a good pedigree. Grandmaster Constantine Landa has played this for white. And the stem game that we're going to focus on in our analysis in this video is Nevidnichi versus Nitsevich from Herceg Novi 2001. These are two grandmasters who I personally played against, two grandmasters who I have a lot of respect for, and this is a game that I think is basically kind of like best play for this variation. Nevnice ended up winning the game, but I'm not sure it was because of the opening. I think the truth is that Nevnice is just such a good technical player that he he probably just outplayed Nebosha in the in the technical aspects of the position. But as far as the opening goes, I think that both sides played critical moves. The actual game here after bishop b5, my opponent played knight takes e5. This is dangerous. This is really kind of dangerous for black. I recommend black plays bishop g7. And after e takes d, queen takes, we will transpose to the stem game, Nevenici versus Nechevich. Instead of this, my opponent played here knight takes e5, and I think this is just too dangerous for black. He's just got no development, and uh, white, white should have the initiative. So open it up, knight takes e5, sacrifice the pawn, and d takes e5. I say sacrifice the pawn because bishop takes c6 is not on the table. We're not going to play this. Bishop takes c6, b takes, queen takes. Give black two powerful bishops in an open position. That would be an absolute nightmare for white. So... The idea is not to win the pawn back, but to keep attacking and keep a positional edge with the pawn structure. So d takes e5, developing now with bishop b3. Black must develop his king side, which is lagging, bishop g7, and rook d1, of course. Now bishop d7, basically forced, because queen c7 would be met with knight d5. So now here I fail to find the best move. It's pretty simple. White must play knight e4. Knight e4 makes a lot of sense. I mean, we were looking for this c5 square, but here it's absolutely fatal if black doesn't move the queen. And uh, instead, I played bishop takes c6, and I, I didn't have enough after bishop takes c6. Uh, there's just not enough in the position. The exchange was too early. The c5 square, not enough compensation for a full pawn. Black has two good bishops that have long-term potential, and, and I go on to lose. But instead, white, although not winning by force, has a pretty huge initiative. If knight e4, black must move the queen, and he only has two squares. I mean, queen b8 doesn't look like a good choice. So queen c7 or queen c8, queen c7 
Queen C8, theoretically, according to computer engines, slightly the safer move. And now the key idea, Knight C5 is interesting, but the key idea, the forcing move, Rook takes D7, when Black loses if he takes with the Queen, because if Queen takes D7, Knight C5, and the next move will be Knight takes B7, knocking out the protector of the Knight on this diagonal A4, E8. So it's just fatal for Black. Fatal loss of material if you take with the Queen. This is forced if my opponent Bernard here wants to defend this variation. Next time he's going to have to play this position with his King on D7. I suppose White could castle here, but Knight C5 is more forcing. And in the event of King C7, Bishop takes C6, B takes C6, the King is quite vulnerable because of white being able to use the a5 square. So theoretically, according to our friend, the computer, black should play king d6. And after king d6, the position looks to me to be very, very difficult for black. Very difficult. Um, I wouldn't envy black trying to hold this position. So I'll let you analyze this on your own. Obviously White's going to castle and he has a massive initiative in exchange for the sacrifice exchange and a pawn. But there's no way that Black is, is fully okay in this position and it's a huge attacking position for White. So I strongly recommend this as probably clear advantage for White and Black fighting desperately to try to hang on in this in the actual game, things didn't look good. We didn't find knight e4. Instead, we played bishop takes c6, and instantly after bishop takes c6, I've given away you know, any advantage that I had. But still, not all hope was lost. I played badly even after that in the actual game. b takes c6, queen h4, which is not too bad. Queen h4, castles, bishop h6. And now bishop f6. And once again, um, black is, is in a kind of bad situation here. Because I have this move queen b4, which I missed over the board. Queen b4, sort of using these squares and leaving that, that rook hanging on f8, uh, guarding any like queen coming to a5. White still has an advantage after queen b4. But in the actual game, I play bishop g5, and this exchange leaves black with a clear edge. So after trading this piece and being able to play f6 to fix this pawn structure, I'm losing. Bishop takes g5, queen takes g5, f6, queen e3, and he unpins with queen c7. This is probably lost now for white. I'm a clear pawn down. His bishop becomes very active on e6 or f5. He has a stronger control of the center. His king is relatively safe. So... No need to look at it anymore. This went downhill, although at the end I almost saved the game. Black should be easily winning here, but he shouldn't have been. He was in very, very deep trouble out of the opening. And for the sake of completeness, I'm going to show you what happened in the actual STEM game, Nemednici versus Nemednici, so you have an idea of what really should happen in this main line. What's really best play, I think, for both sides. So again, this is optional, bishop b5 or taking on d6. It's up to you, but if you take on d6 right away on move 8, then you have to be wor worried and prepared about queen b6, which is probably good for white, but very, very complicated. The game will transpose if black plays normally, though. After bishop b5, the same move as bishop g7, then white will take on d6, will transpose. Queen takes d6. Castles, castles for black, and here there have been a number of games. Again, as I mentioned, Landis played this with white, Nevenici, um, other players. There, there are numerous games in the database, but I think that I've seen h3 played in this move, but in this position, I, I've also seen knight e4 played. But I think that objectively, the best move is bishop f4. There's even another move, rook d1. But I'm not convinced about rook d1. Rook d1 seems like 
a bit weird. I mean, you're taking defense away from the F2 square, and you're kind of hemming in your rook on A1. So I'm not in love with, with this move, uh, rook, rook D1. If rook D1, queen C5, knight E4, queen F5, I think that black is pretty active in this position. I mean, sacrificing again, sacrificing a pawn on C6 um, is kind of standard in such a position with very strong active pieces. Um, so instead, white should play solid developing, bishop f4, and in our stem game, Nevenici versus Nicevic, again from the Yugoslav team championship for Signovi 2001, um, queen c5 was played. This is the best move. There was another game where I think it was land of Whipperman or somebody versus this I am Whipperman, where Whipperman played e5. I don't like this move. Um, yeah, it's playable, but you create a lot of weaknesses in your position. You block your bishop on g7. It weakens the b5 square. It creates more weaknesses for the knight on e4 to go, like g5 square. It's just a move that you don't want to have to play. So queen c5, much better move than, than Whipperman's e5. Now h3 was played by Nevenice. I don't know. I think here maybe um, knight e4 is a little more ambitious for white. Slightly more ambitious move. But Nevenici's move is okay, h3, and knight on g to e5. Nevenici's the kind of player who will grind you down with the smallest positional advantage. Knight takes e5, bishop takes e5, and this is Nevenici's city here. Um, bishop takes c6. And I, I don't know, it looks like black should play bishop takes f4, he played. Um, so b takes c6, bishop takes e5, queen takes e5, queen takes c6, rook b8, and um, rook on f to e1, queen g5, threatening bishop takes h3, knight e4. You see this bishop on c8, Promising, but Nevenici's technique is just too good. He's uh, he's not going to have any of that compensation. Queen h4, queen c3, bishop f5, and um, knight g3. So, black never really got quite enough compensation. Queen g5, b3, rook on b to c8, queen e5. It's typical Nevenici. I mean, he's hanging the pawn on c2, but he knows all endings are going to be good for him. So anything simple, he's so good in simple positions. Rook takes c2, knight takes f5, queen takes f5, and he trades queen. Queen takes f5. And so, you know, it wasn't best play by black in the last 10 moves or so. Black had better ways to play this game. Now Nevenici goes on to win by technique. But, again, if we go back here, I think that both sides started to go a little bit astray in this position after this move h3 probably until now it's best play and move 12 white can probably do better than h3 so this would be the starting position i would think for, for theory where the starting position should be for theory in this line um, so take it from there, folks. Thanks for joining me here at Video Chess Training. I'm International Master William Pascal. Please like and subscribe to the channel. And thanks for joining me here today for Hyper Accelerated Dragon postmortem of our 15-minute game from online play. Thanks again. Bye-bye.